Ha, it works. My first, um, we had an old um, deacon, usher in our church. First, actually, elder, one of the first elders was Earl Mullers. Jeanette Hitchett's not here. The Earl was Jeanette's um, um, father. And Jeanette has been really misbehaved ever since Earl went home to be with the Lord. I mean, Jeanette is in her mid 70s now, but she, uh, besides her gambling and alcohol problems, she's really a wonderful, wonderful lady. But um, Earl used to always say to me, um, Pastor, you raspy voice, and Pastor, you got to listen to those Gaither videos. That's a Bill Gaither song, if you didn't know that, because he lives in old Gaither music. Pastor, you got to listen to those Gaither videos. Just pop them right in there in the church, and people will come listen to them. And, all right, Earl, yeah, all right. I would say whatever I should just so he'd leave me alone and stuff. So one time, I'm, he would keep asking me, have you watched the Gaithers yet? Have you watched the Gaithers? This went on for about a year. And so finally, I was away with my wife, and I was going through the TV, and then I see the Gaither Hours on, something like that. It was um, Singing with the Saints, the old video, one of the first homecoming they did in the 90s. I, I tuned it on, I watched it, and I heard Because He Lives, I heard it is finished, and all this incredible music. I saw these saints just crying before the Lord and being broken, and <laughs> I was bawling like a baby before the end of that thing, and by the end of the day, I'm dialing 1-800 one, one number and putting a credit card on the phone, I'm buying everything they got, and I still, to this day, have every one of their videos, I've cast them all in for DVDs, and we still watch them, my kids grew up on them, they come to town, we go watch them, and I have pictures from Hannah and, and all the kids just right up, right up, going with pictures with Guy Penrod and Gil ba um, Bill Gaither and all of them, you were there, yeah, we said, it was fun, it was part of our heritage, I, I love their music. I'm uh, pretty convinced that's God's favorite, too. I don't know if you realize that, but I'm pretty convinced that's when we get to heaven, that's probably going to be what they play up there. Revelation chapter um, 2. I hope I should get to my notes here. Now, this is the beginning today. is the beginning of the first game of the 2013 World Series. I, I just, I'm not going to say much about that. Um, I'm pretty neutral with these things, and, and, and um, this is my World Series Bible I have right there, and it's just, uh, I've never seen that, that's a beautiful Bible, it's a King James Amplified Bible, Parallel Bible right there, that was made for me by a Yankee fan, and stuff like that, no it wasn't, and so I thought it would be a fitting Bible for tonight, don't you think? Thank you, thank you, so, no, as long as I'm done by 8, I'll be done by 22, let's close, in closing now, if you... <laughs> Acts chapter 2. Revelation is, is quite a book. Some people, and as you go through the Christian community and different people and writers and preachers, and some people live in it. They, they love this book. Um, I don't know why they like it so much. Maybe it gives them some um, um, literary license to make things up or, or to um, um, imagine some things that may or may not be even true or have just maybe a thread of truth in them. But much of this book is easy to translate, and some of it isn't easy to translate. Some of it is John portraying this revelation, this unveiling. That's what revelation means. And, um, and he's describing what he saw 2,000 years ago. Well, we're not so sure exactly what he saw, was actually looking at. But we can make educated guesses, and we can make some pretty certain things that we know about. Jerome, one of the old church fathers, said, Revelation has as many riddles as it does words. <laughs> thought that was good. Martin Luther didn't, didn't even want the book of Revelation in the canon of Scripture. He fought against that, and I believe James. He said, Re Luther's quote, Revelation finds a man insane or it leaves him so. <laughs> thought that was good. So the seven churches, the next couple of weeks, we're going to get in probably three weeks, I'm guessing, maybe two, we'll get into the seven churches. We're going to cover two of them today. Um, the seven churches of Asia Minor, there are about 12 churches in that area, but these are the ones that the Holy Spirit revealed um, to John. And it's significant because some will, will feel and that the seven churches reflect the seven um, phases of church history from the early church right to the modern day with the modern day being the Laodicean church. I probably don't, I can see that to, to a degree, but I probably don't fully embrace that because I think you can go to the New Testament time and see a Laodicean spirit and a persecuted church. You can see the same thing throughout the through every period of church history. There are fervent Christians, there are persecuted Christians, and there are Laodicean Christians throughout history from the New Testament to the current, current time. I could be wrong. I was wrong once. Um, 
she has been a long time now, but it's been <laughs> 20 years, but I could be wrong, but I don't know. But many, many better men than me feel that, that this re all seven churches rep represent a reflection on periods of church history. Now, what I do see, I think we can be um, confident with in the churches of Revelation, is a snapshot, at the very least, a snapshot of our churches today. We see deceived churches today, like we see in Revelation. We see lazy churches today. I'm talking about local churches, as we saw in Revelation. We see worldly churches today, as we saw in Revelation. And we see persecuted churches today. Just finally saw an article in Fox News this morning where they sang, Are Christian, is pers Christian persecution increasing? The media has left that alone. But my friends, when you see a hundred Christians, as Dr. C has shared with us, were killed in a church service in Pakistan and made the news for one day. One day. But that stuff's happening literally all over the world. So the first church, because of time, is Ephesus. Let's just start. Where am I here? Verse um, 1. I'm using the English standard here. I have a couple of translations in front of me here. To the angel. Now the angel here is most likely the local church pastor. The, the, word, the word angel simply means messenger and oftentimes contextually it's going to refer to a heavenly angel coming down. But in this particular case, most will tell you this is referring to the local church pastor, the messenger, the preacher of that local church. And this is the, to the preacher of the local church at Ephesus. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these words hold of him who holds a seven star in his right hand, who walks a seven, amongst the seven golden candle lampstands. I know your works and your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. So he's building them up at this point. He's saying, look, you guys are doing good. You guys are, and they were known. The Apostle John was one of the first bishops of this church. He was a pastor there and oversaw this church for many, many years. So now he's writing about his former church here in the book of Revelation, and from, and from getting their, their revelation from God. And he's saying, you guys did really well. When false doctrine would come in, you would, you'd cut it right off. Somebody would come in and distort the gospel, you'd cut it right off. You did good. You kept the gospel pure. And John the Apostle was known for two things. Keeping the gospel pure and preaching the love of God and loving each other. He was known for those two things. So, but I have this against you. Okay, you're doing good, but I have this one thing against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Hmm. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen... Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come and remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you have, yet this you have, you hate the works of Nicolodians, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. We'll probably refer to that in a few months when we get to Revelation 21 and 22. So this letter goes to Ephesus. Ephesus was a great commercial city of tremendous importance of that day. And if you can go on Google Maps and put an Ephesus, you can actually see the ruins today. You can see the theater and the, the, where Paul preached. You can see the, the foundation of the, of the Temple of Diana. You can see it right from the satellites even to this day. There was a wonderful, um, it was a hub of, of activity. There was a, was it, a harbor is what I'm looking for. A harbor was, would come in and it was one of the big trade centers of the day. The Roman government saw it and gave it a level of independence. They would send judges there and they self-governed. Them and a few other cities were given that privilege. When you talked about Ephesus, you talked about a city that was wealthy, full of debauchery. It was a religious town. They had a, the, what we would call the Olympics of the day was played there every year or every well, how many years it was. <clears throat> the Temple of Diana <clears throat> was 425 feet long. That's big. 220 foot across and 60 foot high. 
It was a sensuous cult that promoted prostitution for spirituality. However, the city was also on a decline. Stuff had come into the harbor. Shipping was harder to get in. It was making it a little bit harder to trade. So here we have, the apostle says, I have this one thing against you. You've lost your first love. If you were to go back to, I believe it's Acts chapter 20, you would find that this church was commended for their love. About 30 to 35 years before this was written. So the apostle Paul and leave in Ephesus, he commends them because of the way they loved each other and they loved the world. Loved the world in the sense of wanting to win the world, not worldliness. But 30 years, that's not that long. 30 years later, less than a biblical generation later, they've lost their first love. Yet, they remain doctrinally on game. They knew what they believed. They knew the clear gospel. They knew what they stood for. They could detect error a mile away. They were dogmatic in their convictions. When they saw something that was wrong, they said, that's wrong. They knew it. And God commended them for that. He says, but I have this one thing. You've forgotten love. You've forgotten loving one another. You've forgotten, forgotten loving the rest of the church. You've forgotten loving, showing that love to the world so they can see who I am. <clears throat> That's the one thing that I have with you. And for that, you have to, if I can, he can say this, repent. John's words, not mine. <clears throat> so he says he holds, verses 1 through 3, I just want to pick out a few nuggets from here. He, um, the words of him who holds the seven stars, that's representing the seven churches. And the, the word holds an interesting word. It's, um, and I wouldn't bring it up if it wasn't. It's in a genitive accusative, which is very unusual here. In other words, he's saying Jesus Christ holds the entire universal church within his hands and under his control. This is a corporate local church. The universal church is Christians across the, across the, the globe. In other words, he is in absolute control and understands everything precisely happening universally in the world and corporately and locally in every local church. He's aware of it. Then he says, work. I know your work, your toilsome labor. Your toil meant to drain ones of the strength. Your patience, the ability to withstand under pressure. And there's a great compliment. But I have this one thing. They lost their first love. If you go to Ephesians today, Ephesus today is no longer a city there. It's a city that they'll equate with it. I call it, if I can say it right, Aya Saluk is the city. And it comes from two um, Greek words, Agios Theologos, which is holy theology or saint theo theologian. And it's referring to the Apostle John. The church in Ephesus has long been forgotten, but the, the man that brought the Spirit of God there is still remembered to this day. He's the last remnant, really, of that day when the church in Acts chapter 20 and the subsequent years after, where they loved right and they were a testimony to a world and a very, very, very dark world. Now, how do you lose your first love? That's my main point. I want to get it. How, how does that happen? That's probably more messages than just the seven or eight minutes we're going to spend on it here today. But I have a few things here. I have six things. We lose our first love when we replace a kingdom mindset with religious tradition and personal preference. Sort of what happened here in Ephesus. They never saw the real kingdom of God anymore as a scope. They saw their own piece of the kingdom and they protected their own piece of the kingdom. Their desires became bigger than kingdom desires. So when you replace a kingdom mindset with my traditions or my preferences, I can lose my first love. In other words, God may be calling me and leading me over here and guiding me over here, but I'm saying, no, God, no, this is what I want, and this is what I like, and this is my preference over here. And God's saying, I know that is, but I'm, I'm asking you, I'm trying to lead you over here because this is where you'll be my greatest witness, and this is where you'll be the, the greatest effectiveness in the kingdom. And Jesus hit this throughout, the, throughout the, the New Testament, especially in Matthew chapter 23, when he went out to the Pharisees and he said, look at your tradition has strangled men. The doctrinal, theologically correct, morally perfect Pharisees. 
Jesus called them dead men's bones and whited sepulchers because they missed the Messiah, the one they defended, the one they were going to crucify, the, the actual Messiah in the name of the Messiah. We're going to crucify you in the name of the Messiah. I am the Messiah. <laughs> but the Messiah didn't pick their package. It didn't fit their, their um, description. He wasn't what they were expecting. He rattled their cage. He changed the rules. He exposed the hypocrisy of their hearts. So the very reason why they served them in the first place seemed to disappear. We can lose our first love when we lose our passion and pursuit for God's presence. We talked about a little this Sunday morning. When, when, when my faith has become mechanical more than personal, when I don't clamor after God and the presence of God. <clears throat> For me in my own life, I know when I get up early in the mornings and sometimes I'll re I read the scriptures every day and I pray every day, but I find myself maybe at one or two or three days later, I really haven't sensed the presence of God like I would like to. I'll get on my knees and I won't get off it and, and I'll sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and I'll praise them and I'll thank them for things until I really sense his presence because I don't want to go away without his presence. If I lose his presence in the course of my day, my day gets arduous and hard. So we know when we lose our first love, when we lose our passion for the pursuit and the presence of God, we don't even think really. When I talk about the presence of God, it's a foreign concept. It's nothing that I even have ever tasted or partook of. We lose our first love when we become self-focused and not mission-focused. I love missions. Because missions is the most selfless thing you could have. It takes the focus off us and sees the whole world. One of the great privileges I've had, and there's people here, Brian, Pastor Brian, Pastor Lewis, so many have traveled around the world. Danny Parted been in South Africa, all over the place. In fact, they tried to detain him there. He broke out. <laughs> and um, that's that. I made that up. <laughs> but it's... Um, but. One time being in Budapest, in fact, Rob was with me, I forget, and another, we were there, and they were singing, I'll never forget it, they were singing the old rugged cross in Russian. And um, I just never forget the moment of, of seeing, here's a song I've sung for so many years, and then I hear it sung in a foreign language with this passion and love and, and, um, and hands raised and, and people's eyes closed and just worshiping the Lord in a language I didn't understand. I heard it in English. The, the words were in, in, in Russian. So there was like three languages there. And, but the tune was still the same and the passion was still the same. See, I don't ever want to lose my, um, my, my f mission focus. If I lose my mission focus, I begin understanding that my, this gospel goes much further than my circle right here. I begin to lose my first love. I can lose my first love, number four, when I become overwhelmed with a wound or a loss. <laughs> when something tragic happens in your life or unfulfilled dreams or a pursuit that doesn't come to pass like I hoped it would, um, it's easy to lose your first love. Maybe it's a business that you're building and it gets so overwhelming and so busy that it takes your time up and takes your attention and, and you see everything as a business opportunity and not a ministry opportunity. We could be losing our first love. When we lose our first love is when you begin to subtly begin to make the holy into something common. Gathering here tonight is holy. Inside you is the, the spirit of the living God in every Christian. And the gathering of the saints is a sacred moment. And Malachi 3 verse 16 says every time we gather together and every time we speak to one another, it's recorded in heaven. We may not think it's that sacred. It may just be another Wednesday night or a Sunday morning or whatever it is that we're doing, but God sees it as sacred. When the hymns are played and the music is wor and people are worshiping, when we give as part of our worship, it's sacred. And lastly, we lose our first love when the gospel stops being glorious to me. When we all of a sudden, the wonder of it disappears. Paul never lost his wonder. He said, oh, it's so great a salvation. 
Oh, it's a glorious gospel. The grace which has appeared to all men. He's never lost the wonder of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was revealed to him. When, when we stop being blown away and by the grace of God and the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God, when those things become normal to us and not supernatural, especially over a long period of time, we may have lost our first love. Guard your first love. When you see the temperature of your love for God and the temperature of your love for his people get cooler, there might be an issue in your heart. Not theirs, in yours. If there's aught against you and another believer, right or wrong, there's an issue in your heart. If there's an issue in your heart towards the people of God and loving the people of God and loving the things of God, you might have a case of Ephesians disease. How do you fix that? It's not that, not that hard, really. You just get on your knees and you repent. Just like he said to the Ephesian church. You say, God, I've got used to it. I've grown familiar with it. I've become religious. I've become opinionated. I, I've become a professional Christian. I... I, I'm self-based, not mission-based. I don't even think about the, the world, the church around the world, and I repent. Create in me a clean heart and do a new work in me. It's that easy, and it's that quick. Then we have this church called Smyrna. It's where you get the old Ur of Myrrh from to the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested. For ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. And you'll give, and I will give you the crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. One of the churches of two that actually pleased God. There was no, there was no, um, thing, nothing wrong here. God didn't bring out one fault. Today, there's still a city um, called Smyrna, about a quarter of a million people, 35 miles north of Ephesus. Great harbor, great wealth, commerce. Had a golden street with different temples in there. Huge theater, library, stadium. The um, Homer was born there. I'm trying to remember some of the things. And this, like Ephesus, was an assize city. It was free from the Roman government. But they had two big challenges facing this church. Number one was Caesar worship. Promoted to keep peace. He worships, everyone worships Caesar. You don't, we just worship Caesar, then we don't have any religious problems, do we? That was the Roman mentality. We're just going to worship Caesar. You know, the, Jews don't, the Jews won't worship their God, the Christians won't worship their God, and whatever other religions of the day, if we all worship Caesar, we just don't have to deal with the religion thing. That's all. So it was against the law, and you know the many persecutions, the ten major persecutions that faced the church. There was, there was, there was Caesar worship, made to bow down to Caesar. And this city, spear, one of the spearheads, one of the capitals of people that started it, because they were Christians and because they would not worship Caesar and bow down to Caesar, that brought tremendous persecution into their church. But not only did they get it from the Roman government, they got it from the Jews. The Jews came in and said, they're the Christian cult. And they broke the law. So the Jews would make up, trump up charges against them and, and attack the church. So they're getting it from the government and they're getting it from the Jews. They were undergoing tremendous local persecution. Persecution has never stopped. We don't hear about it much, but it's really been going on since the, since the cross to present. People dying for their faith and people being put in prison for their faith People facing political and social persecution has never really ceased in 2,000 years. We've been somewhat inoculated by it in this generation in our country, but really, if you want to go back even hundreds of years ago, it was happening all over the world. 
I think there's been a dramatic increase, wouldn't you agree, Pastor Brian? A dramatic increase in the last 25, 30 years. But, but it's never stopped. But just as persecution has never stopped, this is important, persecution has never stopped the church. In fact, just the opposite. It seems like the persecuted church is the most effective church that there is. There's a toughness in them, a spiritual focus in the persecuted church where they know the cost of what it is to name the name of Jesus. In our culture, we can get born again and we can be saved in a church service like this. I, there is no really downside to that. But in other cultures in our, in our world, present day cultures, and you see it on the news if you look, you'll find that the people claim the name of Christ, their family rejects them, their father wants to honor, kill, to do honor killings and kill them, and they have to leave their country and leave their friends because of other religions. There's a price, huge price. You're the nations where there is not a Christian government, Islamic governments, and you'll find that Christians have virtually no rights. Go to Egypt. What churches are they attacking? Christian churches. 2013. But these are the churches, my friends, too, that somehow make their way into the world and make the greatest impact on their environment. This was the Smyrna church. This is where Polycarp was burned. Now, what I love about this church, there was, there was I don't know why I love this about the church, but this is an interesting point of the church. This church received no promises of deliverance. This side of heaven. They had tribulation as it brought out. That word tribulation is the lippus. It means pressure. It's used in classical Greek to mean to be crushed under a great rock cosmic world world system internal pressure they had poverty they were destitute one without anything at all many in the Smyrna church one commentator said we're homeless but what you never saw coming out of their mouth was I'm a victim <laughs> you never saw a poor me and how come God you allowed this they took it and God said, if you're going to throw you in prison for 10 days, but hang in there. Don't, don't quit. Because in 10 days, they're going to kill you. Then you'll be free. Yeah. <laughs> a little funny. when it, That's God's perspective, though. For me to live as Christ, and what? To die is, is gain. The church was not given any temporal good news. All the comfort was promised to them on an eternal level. They were promised a crown of life. I don't know exactly how that manifests. Is it going to be a literal crown? Let's say that it will be. But we know the crown of life is a, is a word, zoe life, and there's different words in the Greek New Testament. There's bios life, which is physical life, biology life, and zoe life is the life of Christ. It's a spiritual life, a higher quality of life. So I'm going to give you a crown of life, but not the life of, of planet Earth, but a life that was born and nurtured in heaven. That's the life you're going to get, I'm going to give you, a life way above the persecution of planet Earth, way above the pain and the discouragement and the questions and the wondering whys. I'm going to give you a love way above that, a life way above that. I'm going to close in just a few moments, but I want to, I want to give you just some verses, that, and these verses really helped me and really ministered to me in my own personal life. My sacrifices, your sacrifices, for the sake of the kingdom of God, will never be forgotten. If you've given something up for the kingdom of God, if you've been out for the kingdom of God, those sacrifices will never be forgotten. There's never been a Christian that served God with all their life, who got to heaven and kicked some cans and said, oh, wow, I wish I didn't spend so much time serving God. <laughs> That's never happened. There's been no Christian who spent their life and their sweat and their blood serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that ever regretted the hours put in. In life, we may kick ourselves sometimes, but like we said earlier, everything in heaven is never forgotten. The secret anguish is never forgotten. The banging on heaven's door with no seeming answer is never forgotten. The questions of spiritual confusion that you pound heaven's doors with are never forgotten. The times when you picked yourself up and you went on when you had no strength, those times are never forgotten. 
The times when you loved, when you didn't feel loved. The times when you believed, when you had no faith. The times when you, you said positive things, when you had nothing but a negative heart. Those things are never forgotten. God remembers them. Man may never see them. Hopefully they never will. But God sees it all and God remembers it all. And there'll be a day, this side of him, when we finally die, or the rapture of the church comes, the second, hopefully that's going to happen soon, right after the Red Sox win the World Series Sunday night, then where we can go. And it's going to be a day, right after that day, then, that, we, that we're going to know it was worth it. God, you were aware of that pain? You were aware of that wrestling I had on the inside? God, if he just had answered me, it would have got much easier. <laughs> no, Tim, I just wanted you to walk. I just wanted you to believe. And I promise you something greater would happen. Let me read you some verses here. I'm going to go through these quick, and I hope they fill up your brain. I hope you just blow up when this is done, because these are just great verses. Boom, just blow up. It's going to be Christian guts everywhere, all over the place, because, 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 because we're just excited over what God this is. Look, remember this, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 24 and 25. Remember the sins of some people are obvious. That would be Jeanette or other people like, I'm only kid. She's not here to defend herself, so I'm just picking on her. Leading them to certain judgment. Watch this. But there are others whose sins will not be revealed till later. In the same way, the good deeds of some people are obvious, and the, other, and the, good, deeds of, uh, the good deeds done in secret will someday come to light. Wow. 2 Timothy 2, verse 12, if we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he, he'll deny us. But that's what he says. If you endure hardship, arduous, toil in life, you will reign with him. You're going to reign with him. Well, how do I guarantee reigning with him? If I just endure my hardship. What's that quality in our English? Non-quitability. <laughs> I made that word up. But that's what it means. I, just, I hang in there. I don't quit. I don't throw in the towel. Even when I get discouraged. Even when I, I want to see responses, but I don't get them. I don't throw in the towel. For Hebrews 3, verse 14. If we are faithful to the end, trusting God as firmly as when we first believed, we shall share in all that belongs to Christ. Is he about to blow up? Because I'm liking this stuff. <laughs> Hebrews 6, verse 10. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love by him by caring for other believers as you still do. I won't forget it, he says. Luke 18, 29. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. Matthew 9, 19, verse 29. And anyone, everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake, I love this, well, listen, will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. So whatever I give up for the sake of the kingdom of God, Jesus, Jesus, red letter edition says, you're going to get at least a hundred times. Any sacrifice you made for the sake of the kingdom, you'll get a hundred times for all eternity. It won't be temporary, it'll be eternal. A hundred times greater than any sacrifice. Anytime you said no to yourself, anytime you took the lower road, or the higher road, I should say, Anytime you've forgiven when you've, been when you've been a legitimate victim. Anytime you sacrifice of your own resources for the sake of the kingdom of God. He says you'll receive a hundred times when you've been persecuted by other Christians or persecuted by the world. You'll receive a hundred times when we get to eternity. That sounds too good to be true because we've never really seen eternity yet. Boy, won't we be shocked when we get there? We have to believe it by faith. So the message for this church is simple. Just don't quit. You hang in there. All these things will wear you out, but don't quit. 
These things are designed to make you quit, but don't quit. Because if you quit, there might not be a crown of life. Do not cast away Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, this confident trust that you have in me, knowing the great reward that it will bring you. Patience and endurance is what you need now so you'll continue to do my will. Then you'll receive all that I promise. Talking to a persecuted church in the book of Hebrews. We can't allow life, my friends, to take us out of the race. We can't allow heartache and pain and grief and loss to cripple us so badly we can't run anymore. This church was poor, had great pressure, they were lied about, but found faithful. And because they were found faithful, they were eternally rewarded. And let me ask you this, and we really are going to close. You think that God's eternal rewards might exceed anything we hope to maintain?